This year, Thanksgiving is on November 26th, and the American holiday is supposed to remind people to be thankful for what they have. At the same time, 868 million people do not have enough food to eat and suffer from malnutrition. The world is suffering a food crisis, and GMOs, whether you accept them or not, provide a solution. Yet there are still groups such as Millions Against Monsanto, GMO Free, and Right to Know that say GMO crops are dangerous. First of all, everything we've been doing with the GMOs has been done for millennia. The first farmers were selectively breeding plants and animals they wanted to survive into the next generation. But now that population is growing faster than supply of food, we need to select plants and animals that are more beneficial to humanity faster than ever before. Genetic engineering isn't using steroids or hormones and a syringe. It's the identification of a desired gene in an organism and transferring it into the genome of another organism, and there's no evidence that it's bad for anyone at all. The science of DNA technology is too complicated for a short video like this, and that's a topic for another day. In the United States, it's traditional for a Thanksgiving meal to consist of turkey, mashed potatoes, pie, cornbread, and whatever foods are associated with the holiday. My family usually had rice with that turkey instead of the traditional sides. This shouldn't be unusual. Rice is arguably the world's most important crop, behind only corn and wheat in production, yet even traditional rice farms are unable to produce enough rice to support the world. In 1953, biologist Norman Borlaug bred a variety of wheat that sparked the Green Revolution. Borlaug would go on to become the man who saved a billion lives and his research led to the creation of organizations that would combat world hunger. One of these was the IRRI, the International Rice Research Institute based in the Philippines. Between the 60s and 90s, IRRI was capable of doubling rice yields and cutting poverty in half using intense selective breeding. Look at what selective breeding has done in the past. Created all the known breeds of dog, horse, apple, tomato, and all domesticated plants and animals. Imagine what levels it could reach if we could literally pinpoint the genes that make up a living thing. Oh wait, we already can. In 1962, plant pathologist Peter Jennings bred a strain of rice from Taiwan called DG Wu Gen with a strain from India called PETA. DGWG was strong, but it had no grain, and PETA had lots of grain but no support for it. Neither crop seems very useful, but the breed Jennings bred had the strength of DGWG with the grain of pita. He called it IR8, India Rice 8. In 2004, all 40,000 genes in the rice genome were sequenced. Now we can pinpoint the genes we want selected in rice, transfer them into other breeds, and create strains that can feed the world. For example, in 2006, plant pathologist Pamela Ronald isolated a gene called Sub1 that allows rice to survive submerged underwater for up to two weeks. Normal rice only survives for three days. Why is this important? In Southeast Asian countries where much of the farmland is not irrigated, monsoons, floods, and typhoons easily flood rice fields and drown the entire crop. When Sub-1 was isolated using marker-assisted breeding, it gave biologists and farmers an opportunity. The gene was transferred into a very productive variety of rice called Swarna, and the result was called Swarna Sub-1 which is flood resistant and incredibly productive. Swarna Sub-1 has been planted by 4 million farmers in Southeast Asia where over 20 million hectares of rice are flooded each year. In the Indian state of Odisha alone, rice yields went up 25% thanks to Swarna Sub-1. There's more. Rice uses a form of photosynthesis called C3 photosynthesis, whereas corn uses C4. C4 uses much less nitrogen and water than C3, and yields are 50% higher among C4 crops. This is extremely important because rice is arguably the world's thirstiest crop, requiring 2,000 liters of water for a single kilo of grain. William Paul Quick of IRRI plans to perform what may be the most ambitious project in biology in the 21st century. GM rice, so it performs C4, not C3 photosynthesis. This seems like a challenge. Photosynthesis isn't controlled by a single gene. It's an entire process that is controlled by many, many genes, and changing it up is incredibly difficult. But C4 photosynthesis isn't something unique to corn. In fact, C4 has evolved independently 62 different times, so it's possible to recreate it, and 
In theory, it would increase rice yield by 50%. Imagine that. It would be a gigantic blow to world hunger. We need funding for projects like these. They can potentially end this crisis that's been plaguing humanity from its very beginning. But, as always, dogma gets in the way. On August 8, 2013, anti-GMO protesters vandalized the field of golden rice in the province of Bicol in the Philippines. Golden rice is a genetically modified rice breed that produces beta-carotene found in carrots and sweet potato, which can help end vitamin A deficiency. Vitamin A deficiency, which is easily preventable, leads to blindness, and about 1.7 million children in the Philippines from ages 6 months to 5 years suffer from it. Just because in first world countries you don't have any need for them, it doesn't mean the rest of the world doesn't need GM crops. If you don't want to eat GM crops, that's fine. If you don't want your children to eat them, that's also fine. If your country is rich and doesn't need them and wants them labeled, that's also fine. But do you know what's not fine? Vandalizing fields of them because you feel they aren't safe even though scientists are sure that there are no risks as of yet. Try telling a farmer who suffers from the monsoons every year that GMOs are bad, or a family with children who suffer blindness, which is easily preventable. You're lucky if the food you eat is healthy and you have a consistent supply. You're lucky if you can eat food without having to farm it yourself. People around the world aren't as lucky as you. They are, whether they know it or not, relying on the fact that there are scientists developing GM crops that could save their lives. If you are anti-GMO, I strongly consider you recheck your facts. And if you're still anti-GMO, please don't get in the way of people who need them desperately. The world can no longer rely on so-called natural and organic farming, as some people like to call it. Give people a reason to be thankful this year. Happy Thanksgiving and thanks for watching.